Well, good morning, Holt Church of the Nazarene. It is good to be with you today, as we already said with the kids, is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church. And I don't know, I don't think I can move that. I don't know what practices you guys have on your birthday, but one thing that we like to do at our house is gather around, blow up some balloons, share some cards, eat some cake, And usually, while we're eating cake, one of the practices that we have is we share with the birthday boy or birthday girl things that we've noticed about them this year. Or kind of both. Or both, yeah, exactly. Things that we love about that person. Things that we value about that person. Does anyone else have that practice? Have Have you guys ever done that in your homes? Write something in the card? Yeah, Ellie has her hands raised, some other people. She's going to go to a party. This is great. Well, I thought today, since it is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, that we would gather together, eat our metaphorical cake. You see, you have your cookies, your muffins out there. Eat our cake and look together. Notice, who are we as the church? What does it mean that we're the church? What do we love about the church? What do we value about the church? Why did God make the church. So let's read that story that we already share with the children. If you have your Bibles or if you're looking at your phone, turn with me to the book of or sign in to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. This is the story of that very first day the church was born, the birthday of the church. The people of God were already gathered together because it was a special holiday, Pentecost. And so we see them gathered together in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And then divided tongues of fire appeared and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were living in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of this multitude came together, they were bewildered because each of them heard them speaking in their own language. And they were all amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear them speaking in our own native language, Parthian and Medes, Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes and Cretans and Arabs, we're all hearing them in our own tongues speaking the mighty works of God. And all of those who were gathered were amazed and perplexed. And they said to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them, they're drunk. They're filled with wine. But Peter stood up and addressed with the eleven. He lifted his voice and addressed them all. Men of Judea and all of you who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. But this is what has been uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days... It says, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on servants, men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. 
Well, as I said, let's gather around today. Let's eat some cake. And let's name who we are before one another. The first thing I notice in this text is that the people of God, on this very first birthday of the church, the people of God are huddled together, right? They're gathered, huddled together. And huddled together there in that upper room, they are filled with the Spirit. So say to your people at your table, you, the church, we are those who are huddled together and filled with the Spirit. Would you share that with someone beside you? You are one who's huddled together and filled with the Spirit. Just say that to someone at your table. Notice this, friends, that it's in their huddling, it's in their being gathered, it's when they're all together in one place that they are filled with the Spirit. We gather together, this is who we are, the church. We're a group of people who huddle together, who are gathered, who encourage one another, who support one another, who know one another. Did you know that studies have been showing that in large numbers, Young people who grew up in the church, going to Sunday school, going to kids' church, going to youth group, are leaving the church in large numbers. There's been some studies that have been done for a long time. They've been saying, why are young people leaving the church? And so they've done these studies of churches from the time a child was little and followed them all the way to their young adult years. And they found this that by and large, those who are leaving the church were those children and teens who never really connected with other adults, who never really connected with people that were just outside of the child group. They didn't connect with the Sunday school teacher deeply, or they didn't somehow connect with the youth worker. They just went to this building. Do you notice what we said at the beginning? The church is not the building. We're not, happy birthday to this, woo, white ceiling and green carpet. Woo-hoo! That's not what we're celebrating. We're celebrating us. We are the church who are huddled together, gathered together, and know one another. In those studies, they found the children and teens, when they reach young adulthood, don't leave the church. It's because they had a long-term relationship with two or three, up to seven other people. A long-term relationship, not just one other person, not just grandma brought me or mom and dad brought me, but I knew two people deeply and three people deeply and four people deeply, five people, six people, seven people. Every week they asked me, hey, how was your week? When I wanted to be called by a silly name like Belize and Kelly and Semi, sure, you played along, Miss Rhonda, in Sunday school today. I'll call you girls goofy names. Because I know you, I laugh with you, I play the silly games with you. And not just for our young people, friends, but for us too. I can't tell you how many people, when I was pastoring in Kansas City, friends, this is true, they had been in the church all their life, and all of a sudden, something happened, and they decided to stop coming to this building. But I think what happened long before they decided to stop coming to the building was they stopped really gathering. They were still walking in the doors of the church. Hear this, this is so important. Those people were still walking in the doors of the church. Open the door, see all the people, but they weren't really gathered. They weren't really sharing. They weren't really huddled together. They didn't really know the people sitting beside them. It was just some form of entertainment for them, not connection. We, the church, are those who are gathered together. And as we're gathered and we know one another, the Spirit comes and fills us. Now, it doesn't stop there. This is so crucial. We're not just the church gathered, huddled together, because guess what happens? The Spirit comes, and he fills them. And all these people gather around, and they say, what is wrong with you guys? You're a little bit odd. And Peter stands up, and he tells them, and three thousand people come to know Jesus and go read the book of Acts and it's like they're just being blown everywhere because the church is never just gathered and huddled we are those who are scattered we're gathered and huddled in order to be scattered out in order to be sent and blown out so the spirit 
read the rest of the book of Acts, is blowing the church all over into random places you never would expect God to show up. So as we gather around and we eat cake, and we name who we are, we remember, we look in each other's eyes and say, this is who you are. This is who we are, friends. We are those who are gathered together, knowing each other, encouraging one another. In real bodies, I, I listen to you, I hear you, and in hearing you, you literally are being encouraged by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit and my being with you. And my being real and open and vulnerable, we are filled with the Spirit, gathered, huddled, and then blown out into the places we already live to show the people we live around who God is. This is who the church is. When I was uh, pastoring in Kansas City, I preached a sermon one Pentecost Sunday on the blowing of the Spirit. I think we had kites and wind and fans. And after that service, This woman came to me, her name was Linda, and she was probably 70-some years old. And in my head, she had just been such a faithful follower of God. She had taught Sunday school, and she had been on the church board, and she was at church work days, and she was just there encouraging, loving, knowing other people. And I, I feel sort of bad confessing this, but friends, in my head, I sort of thought, we'll check Linda's, you know, Linda's been the church. She could kind of just, you know, check out and take a back seat and let other people be the church. And here she is on Pentecost Sunday, and the Spirit knocks on her heart, and she comes to me and says, Danielle, as you were preaching, you asked us to ask the Spirit, where do you want to blow me? And this woman, she comes to me again. She has been faithful for so long. Many would just be like, you're doing great, Linda. And she comes and she says, the spirit is blowing. He's doing a new work in me. And here's what we're going to do. And I just say, okay, yeah, what are we going to do, Linda? What? And she says, while I was sitting in the service, this is what the spirit told me. There are so many people who can't make it anymore. They're not here with us. Uh, They come like once or twice a year because their bodies are so frail. And we can't leave them out. We have to go to them. And so here I'm just like, Okay, yeah, this young pastor. Okay, Linda, what are we going to do? What has the Spirit said to you? And she says, we're going to take the service to them. We're going to pack up our hymnals, and we'll sing a cappella. We'll gather in their homes, the homes of these older people who their bodies are so frail they can't even really make it into their living rooms, but we'll go into their bedrooms. They can lie in their bed. We'll sing songs, and and Danielle, you know what you're going to do? Just preach the same sermon you already preached on Sunday. Don't have to prepare another one. And so, okay, okay, I'm just listening along. And and we're going to invite other people. They can come too. And we're just going to have these in-home worship services with these people who can't make it anymore because this is where the Spirit is blowing us. So I say, okay, Linda, well, let me pray about that. And I go back. And do you know what the Spirit says? Yeah. This is where I'm blowing you. And God just doesn't say it to Linda. God says it to Daryl. And God says it to Danielle. And And God says it to Tim. And so four of us, we start meeting in the homes of three and four and five older people who just can't make it to church anymore. And one of the ladies' homes that we meet in, her name is Martha. She is this older woman who had been faithful at Summit View for so many years, but probably for the last five years had never been able to make it to church except maybe on Easter. And her children would come, and they would wheel her into church. Now, Martha, we go and we meet in her home, and she can barely get out of bed, but she does. And she has this favorite song she wants to sing to us. She wants us to sing to her every week. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, God understood. And God has made something beautiful out of my life. So we sing this hymn, and we preach, and we share a bulletin, and we share communion together. And lo and behold, friends, Martha's daughter, who has not been a part of church in years, probably since she was a child, she starts listening from the kitchen when she's making mom's lunch. And Debbie, who has been involved in drugs and alcohol and just struggled with addiction, Debbie begins to hear these songs. She begins to listen to this sermon. The church is meeting in Martha's home, and Debbie starts to hear and be drawn to it. This thing that the Spirit stirred up in Linda because the Spirit said, I just don't want you guys to huddle together. 
No, 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 you're huddled to be blown out. Debbie starts coming to those in-home worship services with her mom. She carries her mom into the living room and sets her mom up in her chair. And Debbie just kind of stays, you know, around the edges, just kind of listening. And soon Debbie's sitting in the living room. And soon Debbie's singing along with us. And soon Debbie's saying, I want to turn my life toward this Jesus. I want to orient my life toward him. And probably seven months ago, I got a phone call. My phone, Debbie. I I thought, Debbie, who... Debbie, this is Debbie. And he answered the call, and there's this woman on the other end who sounds nothing like Debbie. She can hardly breathe. She can hardly breathe. Her lungs have been so filled up with all of the stuff she's put in her body over all the years. She's in the hospital, and she says to me, they've told me I probably have two or three more days to live, Danielle. And though I was never a part of your church building, I want to orient my life toward that Jesus. That Jesus that Linda talked about, that brought into that room. Danielle, could you sing me that song my mom loved? Something beautiful. So here I am, just sobbing on the phone in my girl's playroom. I'm sobbing on the phone. I'm singing something beautiful. And there's this woman on the other end who can barely even breathe, friends. And she's just trying to get out the words. Jesus, make something beautiful of my life. All of that happened. Because the church was the church, gathered and huddled, knowing one another, saying, hey, I think this is what God's doing in me. And Linda says that to Darrell, and Darrell says, I think God's stirring that in me too. And Darrell says that to Tim, and Tim says, I think God's stirring that into me too. And we move into Martha's home, into other people's home, and Debbie finds Jesus because the church is gathered and the church is scattered. This is who we are. So today, as we eat cake and we write that note, that birthday card to one another, we write that encouraging word, this is who you are, gathered together, knowing one another, and sent out. This is who we are. I want us to look at another passage of scripture. It's just a few books earlier, the book of Matthew, chapter 28. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this passage. Maybe you memorized it as a little child. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. This is what it says. Jesus has gathered his disciples together. He is about to leave them. His body is going on to be with the Father to begin making the new world and bringing it down to us. And he says to them, I'm leaving you and it's good that I go. And here is a command for you. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says to the 12, Go, therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. (laughs) Believe this, I am with you always until the very end of the age. Let's, as we eat cake, let's dig into this. What does this tell us about who we are, the church? Let's notice who we are, be aware of who we are, name who we are. One thing I love about this text that I I remember learning in seminary is this, that that word, the very beginning that we hear, go. Remember, the, the New Testament is written in Greek. And so when you read this in the Greek, here's what it looks like. It looks like this. As you are going along, make disciples. In your going, make disciples. I remember when I first heard that, I kind of took a (gasps) little breath and felt a little bit of a refresher because I always thought if I was going to be the church, be a part of the church, that I had to get on a plane and travel to Africa and there go and make disciples. That I had to follow some people who I knew who lived in Papua New Guinea, sold everything they had, and ate some strange stuff. Because to be a disciple maker, to be the church, I had to go someplace far away. But hear how the text reads. It's just a passive verb. It reads like this. As you're going along, in your goings, make disciples. Do you know what that means? 
Some of us are going to be called to go to Africa. Some of us are going to be called to go to Papua New Guinea. But probably for the majority of us, this is the call of the church. Wherever you already go. As you go there, that's what the text says. Wherever you already go, as you go there, we'll talk about what this means, make disciples. But it's wherever you already go. So literally, in a moment, we're going to think, where do I already go? I know some places I go every single day. I go downstairs from my bedroom into my living room. I go into my kitchen with my kiddos. I go into my living room with my kiddos. I go into their bedroom and into their playroom. I go into my neighborhood, onto my street. I go to the library. I go to the grocery store. You go. Where do you go already? You go to your children's homes. You go to your grandchildren's homes. You go to your friends' homes. You go to work. You go to school. You go to your neighborhood. And as you are already going there, friends, this is who you are. Eat your cake, open your cart, and hear this church. This is who you are. You are people who, wherever you go, as you go, you make disciples. And here's what that word means. Make disciples, make a traveling companion. A disciple was someone who was invited to come alongside and travel with you. So, so simply, here is who we are, church. We are people who go wherever we already go. And in those places that we already go, we make friends. We make traveling companions. We say, hey, want to come along with me? I think about my mom. She does this so well. Like, I have to clean out the church. Hey, Sue and Rhonda and anyone else who's available, want to come and just be with me? I don't want to do this alone. You can just sit there, but as long as you're with me. Hey, I need to go pick up some banana boxes for those compassionate ministry boxes we're going to send. Shelby, do you want to come along and just ride along with me? In the things you're already doing, friends, invite people to come along with you. And as they do, they'll become your student and that they will learn the things you talk about. They will learn and listen and hear with their whole bodies the things you are up to. And when you have seen and experienced God and they're traveling with you, guess what? You don't have to beat them over the head with the Bible. That's not who the church is. As they're traveling with you, they get to see God because you see God. One last passage. Turn with me back to the book of Acts. The very beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. So as we eat cake and we open our birthday cards and we say, hey, I've noticed this about you this year, who are we? Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is who we, the church, are. Jesus says to the disciples, he's leaving them again, but he says this, Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and are you ready to hear who you are? And you will be my witnesses. You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We, the church, are witnesses. That word just literally means someone who sees and hears and experiences and tells what they see. You're a witness. You see God, and you tell what you see. This is who we are, church. Whew. I struggle with that, though, because, friends, to be honest, sometimes I'm going so fast, I don't know how to be a witness and remember what that means. I'm going so fast, I'm not seeing God. How can I be a witness to what I've seen if I'm rushing so fast I don't even see him? My little kids are wonderful backseat drivers, so I confess that sometimes when I'm waiting at a stoplight, I like to look at the person beside me and just notice, you know, them singing to their music or, heaven forbid, they're just picking their nose right there. And sometimes I'm just so staring at the person beside me that I don't notice that the light turns green. And Shelby and Elise, they're paying attention. They're seeing. 
And so they witnessed before me, Mom, the light has turned green, go. So much so that little even Mallory, she's sitting backwards in her car seat, right, friends? But she's paying attention. She sees the cars are going, and I hear her in the back seat, go, Mama, go, go, Mama, go! Stop staring at the booger-picking driver beside you and go! <sighs> friends, we are called to be witnesses. <laughs> we are called to be people who see God and share with others what we've seen, who hear God and share with others what we've heard, who experience God and share with others what we've experienced. But maybe all too often we are going way too fast. We're staring at something else. And let our little children lead us, right? To start paying attention to start noticing God. I don't know if this ever happens in your home, but in our home, whoo, we sometimes struggle with finding things. Like my children will say, Mom, I would like some ranch dressing for my chicken nuggets. And so I say to them, great. I know we have ranch dressing. It's in the refrigerator. Just go to the refrigerator and you'll find it. So Lizzie or Shelby go. And I'm pretty certain, I'm not back there, but I'm pretty certain this is what it looks like. Do, 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 do. Open the refrigerator. Okay, mom, I can't find the ranch. And I know it's there. And I don't really want to get out of my seat to walk back and say, hmm, right there behind the mustard, there's the ranch, you know, on the third shelf in the door. So we've started saying this phrase. And here's how it goes. When you look for something in the Jones household, you must believe that it's there. Look for that thing, like you trust it's there and don't stop looking until you find it. So the other day, we were about to leave for our place on the river up north and Stephen could not find his flip-flops anywhere. Now we have a big bin of shoes. This is really a horrible way to organize your shoes. A big bin of shoes by our back door. It's like a chest kind. So that when you open it up and flip-flops that were used last summer, they're way on the bottom on top of all the tennis shoes and boots and all the other shoes. And if you were going to find those flip-flops, friends, you would have to believe that they were actually in that shoe container. So Stephen and I have looked everywhere for his flip-flops. We can't find them anywhere. And Elise says, Dad, have you looked? Like you believe it's there. Have you really looked for it? Now she knows because I've told her before, you can't just walk in the room and, no, I don't see any flip-flops. Like, you're not going to find flip-flops staring at the ceiling, right? You have to move all the other shoes that are in the shoe container, throw them out, and then maybe you'll find them. So I hear Elise run to the back. I hear the thing open. I hear flump, 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 flump. Dad! Some more. Flump, 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 flump. Oh, Dad! Elise comes running. Pitter, 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 pitter. Dad! You have to look. Like you believe they're there. Wink, wink, wink. Right? We were all so excited. Elise found the flip flops because she looked like she believed it was there, friends. Oh. We, the church, are people who look for God like we believe He's here. We're witnesses who believe God's in my workplace. God is already working in that coworker's life that you struggle with. And that family member's life that you, whoo, it's hard to get along with them. God's working. We, the church, are people who witness God working. See. See God at work. We believe he is all over the place. But we're not so busy just doing, doing, doing that we don't ever stop and notice. There have been so many amazing studies in the field of neuroscience. And one of them that came out several years ago is that they discovered that we used to believe there were just five senses. You can see and you can taste and you can hear and you can smell and you can touch. And there are a few senses that they've learned that we all have. One of those senses is what they call interoceptive awareness. And this is literally what it is. It's the ability to feel what's going on inside your body and know it, notice it. So did you know that some people, they don't know that their body's getting too hot in the car and they just start getting cranky in the back seat because they don't notice, say, could you turn on the air conditioning? It's so hot back here. 
or they don't know to take off their sweater. They struggle with interoceptive awareness. This is the exact same sense that you use to know you need to go to the bathroom. And some people struggle with interoceptive awareness. They just literally don't know they need to go to the bathroom. They, they can't feel it. They don't know that they need to eat, that that's hunger. Well, here's what's amazing. In the field of occupational therapy, occupational therapists have discovered through some amazing studies and research that they can teach people how to strengthen or grow this sense, this interoceptive awareness sense. So with little kids who didn't know when they were too hot or that they needed to eat or that they needed to go to the bathroom, they said, I want you to do this three times a day. Pause. Rub your hands together. Do it with me. Rub your hands together. And now just notice what your hands feel like. Do that. I feel the warmth. Your hands feel kind of tingly. Maybe for us who go so fast, it's kind of awkward to pause and just sit in silence. But we are the church who pause. If we can three times a day pause and pay attention to our bodies and build our interoceptive awareness, I'm convinced of this, church. We can build our God awareness. If we would pause three times a day and say, God, where are you at work right now? I am so frustrated by the situation at work, I'm going to pause. God, where are you at work right now? I am going to witness God. I'm going to see God working, and I'm going to tell other people about what he's done. I am so overwhelmed and sad by this transition that I'm going through. I'm going to pause and see and notice, God, where are you at work right now? This is so tough, but I'm going to pause. God, where are you at work in this? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my people who see and tell what you've seen. We're not going to see, friends, if we're going a million miles an hour. We're not going to see if our phone, if our every spare minute that we have, our heads are in our phones. We're not going to see if every spare minute that we have, we're working, 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 because in order to feel good about ourselves, we have to be doers, accomplishers. We're going to be witnesses because we've sat still and watched God work and named it. The other day with one of my kiddos, we were sitting around at our bedtime. We brush our teeth, and then we read some stories, and then we share a Bible story together. And one of my kiddos said, you know, sometimes I struggle with really believing in God because I don't always see him. And I said, me too. Sometimes I struggle with seeing God or believing in God because I don't always see him. Sometimes I think prayer should work like a vending machine, right? Like I go up and press, I want that right now. And boop, out it comes. Sometimes I struggle in believing in God because I don't always see him. This is why we need each other because we are the church who when I'm not seeing God, you've been quiet and you've been still and you can hold the hope for me. Because we gather together and we testify, we witness to, we share our stories, we stand up and say, hey, this is where I saw God at work. So that my little child can say, you know what, I didn't see God in active ways at work in my life this week, but I heard about how he was at work in your life. And you know, come to think of it, I think he was at work in my life that way. I just didn't know how to look for him. We, the church, we are people who witness to who God has been in our life and how he has been at work. We tell it. So one last story, my church in Kansas City that I was sharing with you about, there was this young student named Tony. And we had been a part of a school where once a week we would go into the school and after school we did this Bible club. So we would sing songs and share stories and um, the girls and I are part of one of those Bible clubs here in the Mason School District during the school year. And Tony had been a part of it. 
And every week on Wednesdays, after we did this little club, we would gather together as this group of five teachers, and we would say this very question. Where did you see God at work today in club? And it was amazing, friends. Five teachers and five different perspectives. One person would say, you know, I really actually, I saw God at work in Johnny. And the rest of us would be like, ah! Johnny was climbing up the walls and not paying attention. How did you see God at work in Johnny today? And this teacher might share, you know, I saw God at work in Johnny because Johnny was really struggling to pay attention. And at one point I just asked him, buddy, you seem like you're not really paying attention all the day. What's going on? And Johnny just opened up about what was going on in his week, and I listened. And God said, just listen to Johnny. So I listened some more. And that's where I saw God at work. And when they told me that story, and I shared with them my stories that were completely different of where I saw God at work, we begin to see that God works in crazy, mysterious ways. We begin to start noticing God in all these places we had never seen him before. Because we started pausing and listening and sitting still and then naming it for one another, witnessing for one another where we've seen God at work. Well, the school year ended. We were about to say goodbye to all these children, and Tony said, the spirit is blowing. And I don't think we can say goodbye to these kids. And I said, well, sorry, Tony. We have to say goodbye to the kids. The school's about to close. There's not summer school. And she said, no, no, no. I think we need to do a VBS style for the kids all summer long, but not just for the kids. So here we are one Sunday, or one random Tuesday, actually, in our church, and we go to the altar, and we begin to pray together, God, what is it you're stirring up? Where are you moving, Holy Spirit? Because remember, the Holy Spirit gathers us together, huddles us together to blow us out. So we say, God, where are you blowing us? And we're at the altar, and we're praying, and this is what the Spirit says. Yep, I want you to start a family club, like a family VBS. And we said, well, people don't really do that, God. You know, people like to drop their kids off and have child care. And God said, I want you to do a family VBS. That's where I'm going. So, okay, we'll do a family VBS, and we'll invite the families, and they can eat dinner together, and we can share songs together, and Bible story, and all these kids that were part of this after-school club will pass out pamphlets, and we'll invite them. And we have 30 kids who come to this club, and we think, there are going to be 30 families in our church. This is great, because, woo, God is working. And so we hold that, that club, and we have our very first night, and we are all excited, and we are praying, and we are excited to see where God's going to be at work, and three families show up. Now, let me tell you, as the pastor who has put all this work and effort into going to the grocery stores and saying, would you give us some food? Would you be willing to, you know, uh, donate us some of your food? And we've put all these games and all this effort and spend all of this money. Whew, I was hoping for a little more than three families. But I trust this is where the Spirit's blowing. The Spirit's blowing in Tony, and the Spirit's blowing that into Danielle, and so we're listening faithfully listening. And these three families continue to come week after week to this family club. And one of these families decides, hey, we're going through a really rough time in our home. Mom and dad were about to get a divorce. We need a group of people. We don't have a group of people. We need a group of people to walk with us through this. And they decide that this church that's gathered together, that huddles together, that they want to be a part of that huddle. But guess what? They're not just a part of that huddle. Then they're sent out, and they're blown out, and they start inviting other people to come and be a part. This is who the church is. We're here to celebrate our birthday today. It's exciting, friends. This is what the Spirit is up to. The whole reason God sent the Spirit was to birth you and me, the church. Because God wanted to do a new thing. God's new way of working in the world, the language that he speaks to the world, is you. The church. We are God's new language, God's new way of working in the world. And the Holy Spirit is forever saying, I want to take that tiny little seed and blow it over here and do something new. And when we're gathered together and we share these stories, God begins working in me, and God begins working in you, and God begins working in the world. So I want to invite you today as we close 
to just ask the Spirit, God, what do you want to do with me? God, how can I begin to pay more attention to where you're already at work? And Holy Spirit, would you empower me and blow me there? I want to join you, God. We, the church, are huddled together to be blown out and join God in all of the crazy, wild places he is working in this world. Amen? Would you pray with me? Would you, as a sign with your whole body, hold your hands up in front of you with your palms facing up to the ceiling? as a real tangible sign and symbol that, God, I'm yours. And would you just say that before God? God, I am yours. Say this with me. God, I am yours. And now remembering that we're not just our own, but we are belonging to one another. Let's say this together. God, we are yours. Would you say that with me? God, we are yours. Do with us as you will. Put us to doing. Put us to being. Help us, God, to pay attention to where you are already working and to join you there. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I want to invite you to, there on your table, to...